Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord with you all on this roadie day Sunday. Woo, Woo roadie days. Hey, I know. We're all locals here. Um, <laughs> well, with that, would you stand with us as we enter into our time of worship through singing together? Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this day, for this time to come before you, Father, and praise and worship. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings, for your faithfulness, Father. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for Jesus and all he's done. We ask that you be with us, just guide us, help us to come before you with open hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. this far in the weekend. Is anybody tired yet? I'm tired. I feel like I need a nap already. <laughs> the weekend has been full, but I'm so glad that you are here an hour early and that we still get to celebrate each other and participate with our community for this parade. It's going to be good. So um, this week, a couple things going on. It's not in your bulletin, but we are having so group this week. That's our ladies Bible study soaking group that meets on Monday nights at my house. And this will be the last one for the month, and next week we won't meet because it will be Memorial Day weekend. 
So come at 6.30 tomorrow. There's also Bible study tomorrow, but not next Monday because of Memorial Day. And um, some other than Thursday, there is men's Bible study at 6.15 here. And I hear it's a good time. So if you're manly, come on out. Um, uh, coming up June 4th, during the summer, we are going to be doing a switcheroo of our first Sunday of the month potluck in the mornings to making it a four o'clock cookout in our backyard, um, hanging out and grilling up burgers and dogs and having lots of fun and lawn games and those sorts of things. So that will be the first Sunday of June and July. There will be one in August. We just have to figure out the timing because that month is complicated. So uh, put that on your calendar because we would love to have you there. And you probably noticed in the lobby, we are still collecting baby items for the Pregnancy Resource Parenting, Pregnancy and Parenting Center. Um, so you can bring in diapers, wipes, and baby food, and then take a little baby bottle, go fill it up with change that you find under your sofa cushions, and bring it back so that we can bless them as well. All right. Are, are, we, we, are we still having the Thursday prayer? Yes. Oh. Still Thursday prayer at yeah. 9 o'clock. Yeah. Will you stand with me as we continue in worship through singing today? Dear Father, we just thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. Help us to honor you and praise you, Lord, and bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.
will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. And I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Kids, you are dismissed to Children's Church.
won't be satisfied by anything ordinary. We won't be satisfied at all. Open up the sky, fall down thy grave. We don't want blessings, we want you. Open up the sky, fall down like fire. We don't want Right into here. 
exalt the Lord. You may have a seat. How's everybody doing today? Good. Uh, I'm a little weary uh, from roadie days. All the lead up to roadie days. And now it's finally here, and my kids are running me ragged a bit between different things. Um, not to mention, there's just a lot more noise in town. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's there. And so uh, that being said, um, something I, I was challenged by just a moment ago is sometimes I take for granted as somebody who's, who's grown up in the church and Sometimes there's churchy words that we use that are our Bible words, and they're, they're words that, that help us express our worship. Um, uh, that last song, I Exalt Thee, man, I've been singing that probably literally my whole life, uh, just from when it was written way back when to, to now. Um, and I've gotten to lead it quite a number of times. Uh, but uh, that word exalt... <laughs> Um, sometimes it's a weird word because we don't use it in everyday language <laughs> um, unless you're a part of different, I don't know, there's different usages of it throughout. Um, but this will all relate, I promise. But uh, in uh, when we sing, I exalt thee, what we're saying is, God, you know, you already are far above all gods. You're far above everything. You are the highest. You are, you are the greatest. You are the most. And then by us saying, I exalt thee, that's us now saying, okay, now in response to that revelation that you are that great, I'm going to choose in this moment, in this place, in this time, I, I lift you high up above every other thing in my life. And so I just want to encourage you uh, that, you know, sometimes we, we sing phrases over and over again, just like the angels in heaven do, how they just keep crying back and forth to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That never stops, folks. Um, and so we sing these words and we repeat them, but they actually carry a ton of meaning. And so I just want to encourage you by that, because when we participate in worship, what we're doing is we're responding to that greatness of God. As he's shown himself to us throughout the week, 
And even in this morning, we, we sing, I exalt thee, because he's worthy of it. And so I just wanted to tag that on there because I think sometimes uh, there's all those fun words in, in, in older songs that sometimes we forget to, to, to explain sometimes, and that's okay. Uh, there's still a, a holiness and a goodness, a sacredness to those expressions. So that being said, we have been in a series the last couple of weeks in 2 Corinthians, um, and it's a letter in the New Testament where in the early church, they had the Old Testament scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, and believers would either use a Hebrew version uh, because they were Jewish, or they would use a Greek version called the Septuagint, and they would use that uh, for, you know, uh, as scripture. But there was also something really special about the apostles who were traveling around uh, teaching the early church the words of Jesus and, and the way of Jesus and leading these people in their walk of faith. And one of these letters in the New Testament was preserved for us. Um, I believe it's inspired. Uh, one of the reasons why we have uh, what we call the Bible today and the New Testament portion, which is uh, everything written from uh, the life of Jesus on through uh, the revelation of John there at the end. Um, all of those letters were widely circulated in the church. So what would happen is uh, an apostle would write to a specific church or a specific region of the church, and then the people would think, wow, that's so good. We need to copy this down, or we need to send it to the next town over. They need to hear this too. Even though it was written to us, we need to have them hear it as well. And so 2 Corinthians is one of those letters that it was written to a specific group of people in a specific town, uh, in a specific region. However, uh, it ended up getting widely circulated and people were able to gather good spiritual meaning from those words that Paul wrote, I believe by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to this church in Corinth. And so let's do a little review over the last couple of weeks. And so our first week, uh, we, we kind of did this sweeping overview while also looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And we learned that God is our source for comfort in suffering. Our second week, we learned that God enables us to stand firm and be faithful people, that God calls us to a life of holiness, and that uh, Paul himself didn't uh, get out of that uh, expectation or that call or that challenge, but that he also reaffirmed that for the people there in Corinth. Our third week, we learned that love motivates to reconcile even when it hurts. Uh, we learned how for Paul writing this letter, uh, this was actually Paul's fourth letter to them. Two of the letters got lost, and that's probably for their betterment and our betterment as well. Um, but uh, we learned Paul wrote to these people for the sake of reconciliation because there was a break in relationship between Paul and that church. And that Paul had such a great love for them that he wanted to be brought back together with them. He wanted that reconciliation to take place. The challenge was it was really painful for him. It really hurt his heart. And so we learned that love motivates to reconcile even when it hurts. Last week, we covered how grace expressed by truth and love restores us to family, and how uh, Paul, uh, he was addressing a certain issue that he had addressed before, and he said, look, you guys have already, you, you've taken care of this, you, you've, uh, you've confronted the person, the singular person who's causing all this trouble in the church, you, you've corrected that person, now it's time to comfort them. Now it's time to come alongside them and to reaffirm your love for them. And so Paul is reminding them of the truth of the correction that was given to those people, while also saying you need to now pour out the love to this person so that they will remain in the family. And so that's where the grace part comes in. Um, I had a pastor friend of mine who we, we talk about once a month, and 
uh, he was wrestling with the definition of grace, and I think it's an apt one where, you know, in grace you have both truth and love, that sometimes truth is a really hard thing to deal with because it's just right there, right in your face. And we, we all want to talk about the love <laughs> and, and the good feels and all that, but that both of those together equal grace. So there you have it. So that all brings us to today. And uh, the title for today's message is Gospel Emission. Gospel Emission. And our passage is 2 Corinthians 2, 12 through 17. And the big idea that we're going to be exploring together is that saved people witness to a captivating, life-giving gospel. Saved people witness to a captivating, life-giving gospel. You can stay on the slide for a moment. So yesterday, um, thanks to Angie's mom being in town, Angie and I got to go on a date in the evening time, got to leave our kids with her, and we got to go down and just walk down Bay Street and enjoy the sights and sounds of Rody Days in all its glory. Uh, we, full disclosure, we did not check any scheduling or anything. Uh, I didn't know that there was even this event as a part of Rody Days called the Rody Mosey, um, <coughs> where essentially it's this opportunity for everybody, anybody and everybody who loves their car. Um, or especially a classic car, because that's part of the whole festival, right? Um, and uh, these people, they just drive literally multiple times up and down Bay Street, up and down, and uh, just without fail, just kept going. I saw probably the same vehicles at least four or five times, just whew, in, in that time period. And well, it was fascinating. We, we were walking down. We saw some friends, and so we stopped, and we were going to watch this thing that we happened upon. We didn't know it was happening. And um, beyond just the sound of this celebration of all the people yelling to their friends who have these cars, the people who have the cars revving their engine and really making a spectacle of it, and then the contact high from all the gas emissions... I mean, there was a point where I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep walking <laughs> because it was just the smell was like, I mean, it, the whole experience was pleasant, but there was a certain smell that, that was associated with Bay Street uh, around that time of night, um, and it wasn't the carnival. It was, it was all these people driving up and down and doing their thing. What well, was fascinating to me, though, in that whole experience is this is my second roadie days of many more to come. Uh, and it was fascinating because I got to see uh, for many, many people, not just the out-of-towners who, who take advantage of our, our good festival, like, but like the local people who love their cars and love working on cars, the joy and the excitement and just the exuberance of hearing the revved engines or seeing the display of the car go by and like, oh, that's that kind of old car. And I'm like, you betcha, because I don't know much about old cars. But there are people who do, and they get so excited and so jazzed about that thing. It was like uh, when Angie and I, we were watching this, I was trying to think of, you know, what would it be like for me? It would be like if I went to a guitar expo and like, you just had like one guitarist and they just had like hundreds of guitars just cycling through and it's like, oh, they did that mod on that one. That's so awesome. Whoa! And I'd be, I'd be freaking out a little bit about that. I say all of that because today in our passage, Paul's going to use a really key illustration. It's a weird one, full disclosure. It's a weird illustration. But what it reminds me of is how there is like an atmosphere or an air about people gathering together, like almost like a tenable, I don't want to say energy because that gets weird, but like there's just a feeling in the air, right? When, when you're together with people, especially centered around a certain festival and you're celebrating together, how much more 
like we hopefully have experienced this morning, people who are centered around the gospel, people who, where we are gathering to celebrate the gospel together this morning. Whether you've been walking with Jesus for two minutes or for 20 plus years, we all gather together because Jesus did something amazing and that does something in our lives, especially when we're together. So without further ado, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. If you'd like to follow along on the screen, you're welcome to do so. Here we go. Paul speaking to the church in Corinth. He continues this, this recounting of his trip. He says, When I came to the city of Troas to preach the good news of Christ, the Lord opened a door of opportunity for me. But I had no peace of mind because my dear brother Titus hadn't yet arrived with a report from you. So I said goodbye and went on to Macedonia to find him. But thank God he has made us captives and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. Now he uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. Our lives are Christ-like fragrance, rising up to God. But this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. To those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom. But to those who are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. And who is adequate for such a task as this? You see, we are not like many hucksters, who preach for personal profit, we preach the word of God with sincerity and with Christ's authority, knowing that God is watching us. So the first thing I see in our passage is that God provides the way for the gospel to advance. Paul, uh, he, had, he had left Corinth to go to Ephesus. He spent about two years at Ephesus, and then there came a point where he figured, things are going so good, I'm going to go back and visit all these other churches along the way. Uh, we've covered that in past weeks in, in kind of his itinerary and his timeline of what he was expecting to do, um, so much so that when he had corresponded with Corinth, he had planned to visit a couple of times. He had only visited at one time. It was a bad, bad moment. And so all of that, you can review that in the last couple of weeks, the messages online. But for Paul, he, let, he, he went to Ephesus, he left Ephesus, and then God gave him this opportunity to go to Troas. Troas, um, because that's not, uh, you know, a very popular name that just whew, comes to mind. Uh, it's actually a port city, a pretty pivotal port city, 10 miles south of the ancient city of Troy, where there's a lot of uh, uh, stories and legends of antiquity, uh, like with the Odyssey and, um, and different Greek myths and that kind of thing that center around uh, the city of Troy. And uh, we even have that whole idea of the Trojan horse because of Troy and whatnot. But there was actually a port city that was so pivotal uh, the Roman Empire, when they conquered uh, Greece and Macedonia, they thought, hey, we should probably make this, this spot in Asia Minor, right over here, this, this port city of Troas, we should actually make this the capital city. And so Paul, as he's traveling along, he's going along the main roads, he's doing his thing, and he has this thought, hey, I can preach the gospel here. And then that'll be another opportunity to spread the gospel even further and further and have greater influence because this is such a, a pivotal city where lots of people come to. And so he went there, but he didn't have a peace in his heart uh, because he had sent Titus with that, that painful letter to the people of Corinth, but Titus hadn't come back yet. And Titus was uh, a close confidant. Uh, he calls him a brother in the Lord where, um, you know, this, this partner in ministry, 
he had sent him to go deliver this painful letter and make sure all the things had happened, but Titus hadn't come back yet. So Paul, he's just reviewing the fact that these are the things that were on his, his mind, the things he was going through. But I think it's really important for us to understand that for Paul, uh, he was really leaning on where God was directing him to go. That he had made these plans, he had had this great idea of, hey, I'm going to go and encourage and comfort the churches I planted along the way, maybe start a few new works here and there, like in Troas, even really good ones. And God is the one who opens up opportunities for him to do so. For you and I, uh, we have open doors of opportunity each and every day to share the gospel. And I would submit to you, uh, not just uh, quoting some track that you get at, like, online, like the four spiritual laws, although, like, there's good content there that's good stuff to, to understand or, like, wrap your mind around, but sharing the gospel doesn't have to be this weird, mysterious sort of thing. It could just be sharing with somebody what Jesus means to you. It could mean just you sharing life and, and sharing about how God is working in your life today, not just how he worked in your life 20 years ago. Because for us as saved people, as people who have responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ, who have been saved by grace through faith, we are witnesses to that captivating, life-giving gospel and God is the one who provides the way. We don't have to necessarily just manufacture all these plans on our own. God is the one who either opens or closes a door as well. You can go to the next slide. The second thing I see in our passage is that our lives emit that Christ's love has won. I've been wrestling all week of trying to figure out how to talk about perfume because that's a, a key image. And as somebody who doesn't uh, wear uh, perfume or even cologne that much. I'm like, I know what I want to say, like what I think really needs to be said about this, but I can't quite find the word for it. And I was looking, and there it is, this word that I've never used in my entire life, emit, <laughs> where it's like the root word of emission, where, you know, when we have, uh, when we take our cars through DEQ, um, emissions control. What? Oh, we don't. We don't. But Angie and I, we were from Portland, and we used to have to. And praise the Lord, we're in rural country now. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you know how your cars, like, emit pollution, right? <laughs> but so Paul, he uses this illustration, and it's a funny one. It's weird because on, on first reading, you're like, Really? Paul, are you really going there? Why are you bringing, why are you alluding to this? It's not unusual for Paul to use um, a local illustration example that people would be able to relate to. Um, we see that uh, the guys on Thursday mornings we just read uh, in the letter to the Ephesians, how uh, Paul talked about the armor of God, and he referenced the way a Roman soldier looked in, like, the helmet of salvation and, and all the rest of it and everything. So he's able to use these, these things that people can connect pretty easy with and have, like, oh, yep, mental image, got it. But it's so funny because he, he says in verse 14 that God has made us captives and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. Now, what, what that is, what that moment is, is he's referencing how when the Roman Empire would go and conquer a territory or a city or whatever, to celebrate that, that victory for the Romans, they would have their, their group of captives kind of led along in chains alongside or like along behind where the Roman military, they're putting on this big grand display and you have the captives going behind 
as, as servants and as slaves of this new empire where those captives are now subject to that authority. What makes it weird is that usually when we talk about the gospel, usually we're talking about all, all the really positive good things, all right, true things, the grace and the love and the mercy that we find in the Lord, the gift of salvation that he gives to us. And yet, this image is one of slavery. Now, technically, slavery, we, we could make the argument, okay, slavery back then didn't mean the exact same thing as slavery does now, okay? But still, there's that image and it's hard to grapple with because that's not where we initially go with the gospel message, is that somehow we're now a part of this big train that is declaring the, the triumph of this authority. So what do we do with that? First of all, if we were to take the image apart, okay, that Jesus is the one who won the victory that God, in his love and in his mercy, he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for yours and my sin. And everybody, for all of history, millions and billions and billions and trillions of people all throughout history, paid for by Christ's death on the cross in one moment. Not only that, but Jesus defeated the grave when he rose from the dead three days later, issuing us, for those who believe, new life in Christ. There was a victory. Well, there was a battle. There was a victory. And now for those of us who have been captivated by that, that message, that story, that love that God had for us, we are now brought from the kingdom of darkness into his glorious light, and we are like in one big long group of a parade declaring that Christ has won. What's strange about that is that he uses a negative image or what would have maybe been perceived by non-Roman people to be a negative image to illustrate how Christ is actually king, not Caesar. That Christ is the one who has won the victory, and we now, as participants in that kingdom, we have been captured by that grace. And even though that in, in all, like, earthly technical language, that would be seen as, like, a negative, that Paul is, is using it to say, no, this is actually a good thing. That... What, what looks like a not good situation, Jesus actually turns it for good for us to, to do that. Now, along with this, so continuing on in verse 14. So uh, Paul says, now he uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. So when Rome would do these different processions and things, what they would do is all the temples all the houses of worship would bust out their incense and, and be lighting off this incense to create this aroma of their worship in these different things. Now, that was a pagan uh, moment, but even in, in Jewish culture and in Jewish worship and in, in some churches today, incense is used as a form of worship. It's used as a, a part of what we do like similar of how we use songs and, and different things and, and whatnot, they, they use that aromatic scent, that, that perfumey kind of smell to, to represent prayer and offering up an offering to, uh, to the Lord. And so, to complete the illustration, so Paul is saying, our lives emit that, well, he, he's not saying that, I said that, but, but I'm summarizing, that our lives emit that Christ's love has won the victory, Christ is God, he is king, and he has won, 
and we are saved and we're captivated by that gospel, that message, that good news, that means that as we are walking along in that procession, metaphorically speaking, that our lives emit something. That even if we are, you know, newly saved, barely like, well, no, fully covered by the blood of Jesus, but like barely saved just a moment ago, that our lives, we emit something. A glorious perfume, if you will, because Paul uses that language, to talk about how our lives, it's pointing to the Lord. It's pointing to the worship and, and this, the celebration of the fact that Jesus has won. And so saved people witness to a captivating, life-giving gospel. Us, as a part of that train, as, as a part of that procession, we are now bearing witness to the fact that Jesus has won and we're, we're captured by that love and that now our lives are, are in this trajectory of following the king. You can go to the next slide. So the, the third thing I see, though, is that there's a problem. That's all well and good. And even in, you know, the strangeness of that illustration, that's all well and good. But there are two experiences that Paul lays out of how people receive the gospel. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, so buckle up. So the first one is that, you know, for those who are perishing, is the words, words that he uses, this fragrance, this aroma, this perfume, this emission from the gospel in our lives, applied to our lives, it smells like death and doom to those who are perishing, to those who, who are not being saved, like who haven't, like, who are not a part of that, that group. It smells like, oh, I don't, uh, that gas emission from all those cars in Old Town, what's going on? Like, you know, uh, for the people where that's not their thing, like it smells bad to them like off-putting, ugh, what do we do there? Contrast to the people who are being saved, the gospel is life-giving, and it's a sweet aroma. Here's the problem, though. You and I, God, he opens doors for us and makes a way for us to share our faith in the gospel. He, he's the one who makes the way. We just naturally even do it just because we have been saved. And so like our lives, they just they radiate this new smell of, of gospel freedom kind of stuff. But then when people encounter us, without us saying anything negative, anything off-putting, there are going to be some people who are ready to receive that and some people who are not. There are some people where they're caught up in, 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 all, in all the excitement and even all our excitement of, uh, of talking about Jesus and the difference he's made in our lives, where even if they are dead and perishing, they're like, oh, yeah, kind of like I was, where I'm like, I'm dragging, I'm weary, I'm tired of roadie days a little bit by this point last night, and, and like I ha but I had these friends who were like, no, this is awesome. Look at that car. Wow. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll endure the contact high from this gas emissions. That's fine. That's fine. It's okay. And it, in a way, it became, don't call me crazy, but like it became like this, this sweet perfume a bit of that experience. But then there are people where it's like they are so not ready to receive that. They're not ready to receive the gospel. And it's not our job to force it on them. It's our job just to live our lives in, in humble obedience to the Lord, in, endeavoring to honor him with our lives. And in and, and the times when we mess up, we confess, we repent, and we, you know, we get back up again and we, we keep walking this, this walk of this procession like if we trip. And, and you know, 
God is still glorified in our lives. It's not our job to try to have to like shove the gospel at people because our lives just naturally emit that gospel air about them, right? <clears throat> so save people, we witness to a captivating, life-giving gospel. And what that means for me in light of that kind of revelation from what Paul's talking about is that my life is a witness to something. And when I talk about the Lord, when I talk about the gospel, what am I saying? How am I communicating it? Is it like it was in the olden days when you'd be like, ah, oh, yep, I'm saved, that's really great, but I can't do this, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't do, you know, be at this event or this kind of establishment because, you know, they sell this certain thing or whatever, and like, it kind of becomes this negative communication of the gospel where it's like, oh, well, what are you even joyful about? <laughs> you know, uh, you know, it's great that you're saved, but what gifts? Um, and, and, and with that, if I'm witnessing to a captivating, life-giving gospel, another question is, am I actually letting it captivate me each and every day? Not that it has to be like this like every moment experience, but do I let it kind of captivate me with the wonder that, wow, God loved me so much that he sent his one and only son for me and reminding myself of that salvation that I have in him. And I would submit to you, are you captivated by the gospel in that way? All right, you can go to the, the next slide. The final thing I see in our passage is freely giving what we've received from Christ. So Paul, there at the end, he's making a transition point in what he's talking about. He's kind of summarizing his ministry and what he's doing. And um, I love that, I don't know what the, the actual original <laughs> word in the Greek was, but I love that in this English translation, they say hucksters. Who says that? these people did. And so, um, but, but Paul, in verse 17, he points out, you see, he's telling to them, you Corinthians, you see, we, meaning Paul and his group, we're not like the many hucksters who preach for personal profit. And that word for preach, it's not just teaching, it's that proclamation of the gospel, it's that declaration, that kind of thing. So, Paul, he's not preaching for personal profit, Instead, Paul says, we preach the word of God with sincerity, with Christ's authority, knowing that God is watching us. What's going on there? I believe that it's, Paul is saying, look, we've received this gospel for free. We didn't have to do anything for it. Like, yes, technically Paul, like, had this indentured mentality because God said, you persecuted my church, now your life is not your own, you're going to be a witness to me. So that's a whole other level of what Paul's doing. But what Paul is communicating is that he's not trying to just peddle another message to gain a few bucks, like some of the people uh, walking around Old Town who are dressed up a certain way might be like, hey, give me a tip for giving you such a good show, right? Give me, give me a tip for giving you this good message for that photo op. Give me, give me, you know, open this hand. That happened to us on Friday. <laughs> I was like, oh, geez, okay. But, um, but what Paul is saying about him communicating the gospel, of preaching the gospel to the, the places that he would go, like Corinth, is he isn't doing it for a sur surcharge or to get any money or benefit from it. He's just declaring what he received from the Lord. And the challenge becomes that this life-giving gospel is really good. It's a not, I don't want to reduce it down because I think it, 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 it pollutes it a bit, but like, 
in, in terms of product, the gospel is amazing. It's good news for those who are perishing. It's good. It's good for us. However, like, I don't think we should be making a profit off of it. Or, if you will, if you're on social media, it's like if you're doing your daily devotions and you, like, snap a pic of it or, like, you take a selfie and it's like, hashtag church flow. I've done that before, I confess to you. Like, you know, or, or you're doing it for the accolades of I'm, I'm doing this thing and I want you to, you know, I want to get that, that feeling of you being proud of that fact or, or that kind of thing. Paul is saying, we don't do it for any of that. We're doing it because God's watching. God's given us this task. And we're just going to be faithful with what he's given us to share it with anybody and everybody who will listen and give us the time of day who will understand and receive what we're giving them as that sweet perfume. Not to shove it down their throat, but just to be faithful to what God's given. And so, with that, that, that last idea there of, you know, how saved people witness to a captivating, life-giving gospel. That gospel emission that just naturally overflows from our life. I think a big question becomes, have you received that good news? And what I mean by that is we can do the checklist in our brain. Okay, Jesus, Son of God, check. Jesus is God, check. Okay, cool. Jesus died for my sins, check. Got it. And we can, like, make that mental ascent to know, okay, that makes sense. I'll, I'll believe it as true. I'll say it's true. But there's a difference between that head knowledge and the heart knowledge that when we receive the gospel and we really embrace and know that God actually loves me and he came to save me from all of my muck and crazy. Like, God came to save me and I, I'm embracing it. I'm internalizing it because he is so good and I'm, I'm now... I receive that salvation and I embrace it. I'm not just trying to work on it on my own, but I'm actually, like, I'm trusting in it for salvation. There's a difference between just knowing it and really knowing it. You understand? Or are you with me on that? And so my challenge to you, for those of us who have been walking with the Lord for a long time, or for those who maybe it's our first little bit with the Lord, is to pray and to reflect, to find out whether or not we, like, am I living like I've really received it or not? And if not, God, what, what, do, I, what do I need to, what do I need to, to really receive it? Really, you need faith, but like, you know, to say, okay, you know, to open yourself up and say, God, I do receive what you have for me today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for all that you do in our lives. Thank you that you have given us this new day full of mercy and full of grace, that each moment we have a heartbeat is a gift from you. Every moment we have this breath to breathe is a gift from you. The fact that we're able to participate in this time and learn things from your word, God, that's a gift from you. And so, God, we thank you for that. We thank you for hard illustrations like Paul uses to, to talk about his experience with the gospel and how, God, you so captivated his attention with your love and your grace that it's like he's a captive in a big procession pointing to the king, the one who's won the victory. God, help us in our lives to, 
to trust you and to really know in our hearts what you did for us and that as we live this life, we would respond accordingly and we would walk out this faith uh, to let our lives be a witness to you, uh, the good and the bad. Uh, God, you use all of it uh, as a way of telling your story of redemption in our lives. And so, God, we, we, we surrender to you and we give you this week to, to give us opportunity to, to live lives as believers who are emitting the gospel everywhere we go. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Jesus, that you won the victory and that we have this assurance of faith in you. God, we give you this week in your name. Amen. All right, friends, would you stand with me and receive this as your send-off blessing? It has been so good to be here with you all, and uh, I'm encouraged to, to be together next week as well, and even out in roadie parade land uh, in just a moment. But I'm excited for you guys. I think this is a good thing that you were here today. Um, that you got to hear about the gospel, that you got to hear about the Lord and, and, and his love for you. And so as we go from this place, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Have a great week and happy roadie days.